I'd like to do is welcome you and thank you for attending today. Welcome to our Business Builder Speaker Series. Uh, at Schaefer Convene, we try to find ways to give back to the real estate agent community that we serve. And one way we do that is hosting these monthly sessions where we bring speakers that we think have an excellent topic that is uh, of great interest and importance to real estate agents. We know that we're, you're busy and we appreciate you giving us your time to join us today. While these uh, sessions are valuable, they are a one hour Zoom session, so they're not approved for CE credits. To make the most of your time, we encourage you to ask questions and participate utilizing the chat box. Before I introduce today's speaker, I'd like to invite you to join us next month for our business builder uh, speaker featuring Dagmar Sands, setting yourself apart from your competition, what the FIA BCI, which is the International Real Estate Federation, has done for me. And that'll be the third Wednesday in October, Wednesday, October 19th, from 1 to 2 p.m. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce you to this month's speaker, Whitney Brennan with ITX 1031. Uh, she's Vice President of Investment Property Exchange Services, and she's going to talk about IRC, that's Internal Revenue Code, Tax Deferred Strategies. Whitney, thank you for being our guest on our Zoom session today. So um, thank you. I appreciate um, the kind invitation to speak to your group today. Um, and uh, I just wanted to say uh, to all of you out there that if you're uh, a new real estate um, broker or agent um, and this some of this goes over your head don't worry about that um, you just need to be mindful of when someone says a 1031 exchange that you have an expert that you can turn to just like you would um, you have your um, inspectors that you like you have your favorite uh, closing attorneys like that um, you always align yourself with experts so um, if you ever have questions, you are welcome to email me or call me anytime. My email is at the bottom. My phone number will be at the end of the presentation. So I work for a company um, called Investment Property Exchange Services, or IPX 1031, and we are a qualified intermediary. And our sole um, role in a real estate transaction that involves a 1031 exchange is to provide the paperwork and the facilitation of that process. I've been a qualified intermediary for over 20 years now. And um, what we do is we help your clients to defer their taxes just when they sell an investment properties. So this tax code um, can only be utilized when you're doing a 1031 exchange. And the focus um, or the I should say the primary um, role of the intermediary is to provide the paperwork and to provide um, a safe and secure transaction. And we also wanna um, operate within the safe harbors of section IRC 1031. And many of you have, have probably worked um, with clients, investors that wanna utilize a 1031 exchange. First and foremost, I tell people, um, it is not a tax-free transaction, it is a tax deferral. So if you're selling an investment property that has a gain in it and you will be um, probably paying some type of tax, then the 1031 is a great way to defer those taxes and it is just a deferral. So if you do a 1031 exchange, you're going to defer the taxes and we'll talk about those taxes in, in a moment. But um, in order to make your transaction a 1031 exchange, you're gonna wanna include um, the exchange clause. As well, you're going to want to seek out um, an intermediary that you trust and um, have either worked with before or comes recommended. And the reason I say that is that there's um, that all intermediaries are not the same. Uh, the intermediary that I work for were owned by Fidelity National Financial, and um, it's a large uh, group that does financially back us if we needed needed that, but we're a very strong company in our own right. Um, we're a multi-billion dollar company. So to do a 1031 exchange, you do need a qualified intermediary or a third party to prepare legal documentation called an exchange agreement that needs to be um, in place and signed on or before the date 
of the settlement. So a lot of people want to know, what is it that you're actually deferring when you do a 1031 exchange? Well, I'm not your CPA or tax advisor, but having been around this industry for more than 20 years, I can tell you, generally speaking, when your client sells an investment property, they're looking at anywhere from 25 to 30% in taxes, depending on how long they've held their property. If it's over a year and a day, um, you would be deferring long-term capital gains to the IRS. If you have a certain gain, um, and this only applies to certain um, taxpayers, but we'll talk about the uh, healthcare um, tax. It's called the net investment tax that could kick in if some of your investors have a very significant gain. Also, investors, um, when they own investment property, take depreciation. So depreciation recapture would be something you would owe if you sold your property outright. However, the 1031 allows you to defer that tax. And then depending where you are in the US, I'm physically located here in Atlanta, Georgia. Um, if you utilize a 1031 exchange, you can defer state taxes. So this is a question that often comes up. What are the taxes I can defer? defer? And um, these are the taxes. We'll touch upon them briefly, but the IRC code is recognized in all 50 states. Um, just real quick, going back to the previous um, slide, capital gains kicks well, in. Whitney, pardon mm -hmm. me. Um, I see the welcome, Whitney Brennan. Forgive me. Am I? I think I might. It might be. It's on my end. You are sharing your screen. Everyone is seeing Whitney's presentation, correct? Can you see it okay? That's what we I have... wanted to make sure that everyone is seeing uh, Whitney's uh, presentation. I appreciate that. Um, I um, was realized I was looking at the introductory slide that I I, I don't see. I don't see it. Let me <laughs> um, give you, uh, Whitney, let me try this again and have you share your screen. Okay, um, let me just click out of this. Now, are you sharing, Doug? No, right as a matter of fact, I am not, and I'm making sure, go ahead and share yours. Okay, I'm going back to the presentation. I can see it now. Okay, thank you. Wonderful, thank you. I'm yes, sorry about that, Okay, yeah, no problem at all. I appreciate you bringing that up. So just um, going back to, can everyone see that? Yes, internal revenue. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. Um, Doug, if you want to monitor the chat box while I'm um, presenting, that would be fabulous. So, I'll do that. thank you. Th thank you. So, I was just basically saying that the tax deferred exchange is only a deferral of your taxes. It is not a tax free exchange. So, once you do an exchange, you're just deferring the taxable event for that transaction. And if you sell a property that came from a 1031 exchange, um, particularly if it came from a whole line of exchanges, if you started off by selling one property and exchanging, 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 maybe into your 10th investment property. If you sell that 10th property outright and don't do a 1031 exchange, you would owe taxes back to the basis of the original property. So it's always good to inv um, invest some time talking to your CPA and to an intermediary to make sure that you're um, doing what you think you, you, you want to be doing and you're going to achieve that end goal. For most of my clients, uh, they want to achieve full tax deferral. Um, and we'll talk about how that's done in just a moment. But uh, real quick here, um, we'll just, let's see if this is now we're stuck here. There we go. I was just mentioning that depending on how long you've held your property, you're going to owe either long-term capital gains or ordinary income. Ordinary income kicks in for properties you've held in under a, a day, a year and a day, and long-term capital gains kicks in after a year and a day. So um, typically when you sell an investment property, 
our investors are either going to pay 15 or 20 percent to the IRS. If they've um, had a, a great uh, return on their investment for an individual, if they make over $200,000 in gain, then they're going to get to pay an additional 3.8% on their, their taxes. And for a married couple, that net investment income or healthcare tax kicks in when they've uh, made over $250,000 um, in gain on their property. Uh, for many investors out there, they buy investment properties to generate income, but also they count on the benefits of taking depreciation um, each year on their tax return. And so um, that benefit is great um, while you're owning the property. However, when you sell the property, depending on all the depreciation you've taken over the years, you owe 25% recapture um, when you sell the property. And finally, the last tax your client might be faced with is the state tax where the property is physically located. So I was mentioning earlier, I'm here in Georgia. And um, if you sell a property here in Georgia, the state tax you could pay would be up to 6%. So when you add up all these taxes, you could be facing a tax bill of up to 30%, which is a very significant um, tax. Uh, so people entertain doing 1031 exchanges when they sell their investment property. I just have a quick picture here of the United States. It can show you, um, A, um, that all states do have, well, I should say, uh, there are 41 states that do have a state tax, and there are currently nine in the United States that have a zero tax. A lot of people will use those properties that have a zero state tax as a way to mitigate their taxes when they're exchanging out of properties at the end of their exchanging period. That's one strategy, or a lot of clients will swap till they drop. And then when they die, the taxes they've deferred, the obligation to pay those back go away upon death. Also a nice benefit when you're doing 1031 exchanges for the exchanger. When they're gone and their heirs inherit the property, as I mentioned, all the deferred taxes go away, but that basis from the original property gets stepped up to fair market value. And if the heir turns around and sells the property before the property goes up um, in value, um, then they can basically sell the property and put all those um, monies in their pocket. At least today, um, when you do that, when you die, you have $12.2 million exclusion. So coupled with the 1031, it's a great tax planning strategy. So a lot of people will ask, what type of property can you exchange? And they hear this word like kind getting thrown around, which can be misleading sometimes, but like kind property pretty much means you can exchange any type of investment property for any other type of investment property in the United States. So you can exchange commercial for residential and vice versa. And um, that property, when we're doing an exchange, the first thing I ask clients is, are you selling an investment property? One. Two, um, how long have you owned the investment property? And then what percentage of the property do you own? Because you can actually exchange percentages. So um, we basically want to make sure that you've held or your clients held the property for productive use in a business, trade, or investment. And that is really what like-kind property um, is about. It's about the intent in which you hold. It's not about the property type, per se. So if you've held a single-family rental for a year and a day and you've been renting it out, that would indicate that you've been holding for productive use. And you can go from that residential property to a commercial property for a replacement property. And that's perfectly acceptable. And um, so just to spell this out, I like to see it in writing. Um, these are all examples of um, like-kind property. And again, it's about the intent. So you need to hold for productive use. What would not qualify would be a short-term hold. Like if you were a flipper, you go in and fix up a property very quickly with the intent of resale. And that is not the intent of a 1031. So you wanna hold for the intent of holding for a longer period of time to show that um, you're an investor and not really a, um, a flipper per se. So residential for commercial, commercial for industrial, single family for multifamily all works. You can even exchange a non, um, 
income um, producing property such as vacant land for a residential property. And so some people might ask, well, does the fact that I'm not collecting an income from that the relinquished land, um, does that negate the, the 1031? The answer is no. Uh, you could be holding land with just the desire to um, improve your investment with time. You buy it for a certain price and your hope it was a go will go up over the years. And so that land doesn't necessarily generate an income. So um, also when COVID hit, we had a lot of uh, clients have properties that were vacated or they didn't have a income stream. So if you find that you don't have an income stream, it doesn't negate the exchange either. Certainly we'd like to hear all the, the variables surrounding the transaction so we can guide you properly, but swamp plan for bank building works perfectly fine. So to understand why or how you can benefit from the 1031, um, you might wanna know the reasons why people um, exchange so that you could apply them to your client situations. So we're, we have we're, a lot we're, of, we're, go we're, ahead. Real quick before we move on, we yeah. talked about uh, how a flipper, someone who buys to renovate quickly and resell won't qualify for a 1031 exchange. The question was raised, uh, how long do you have to hold the property for what amount of time in order to use the 1031 exchange? It, I've heard you use a year and a day. Is that the minimum mm -hmm. requirement? That's about the minimum requirement. Um, the tax code never specifically comes out and says you must hold. It uh, discusses two tax years and a, the year and the day um, is often used because that's when long-term care gains kicks in. So um, that's a safe amount of time. Um, the longer you hold, uh, I tell people the better off you can sleep at night. But you, it's really about demonstrating your intent. Certainly we have people that have been approached when they're fixing up properties to rent and sometimes they get unsolicited offers, which falls into a different category. So for a client that does fall into that category, they really do need to be mindful um, just because they have an unsolicited offer doesn't necessarily protect them, but um, it's about what their intentions were when they bought the property. If it was to flip and sell, that doesn't qualify. But if it's to fix up for um, a renter, then that's a different, um, a different uh, story altogether. But I've had clients where their intention was to rent and then they get this unsolicited offer. So my advice to you, if clients do go forward in that situation, is they document the transaction. Sometimes they'll even put it into the contract that it was an unsolicited offer and have the buyer sign. So people exchange for various reasons. They want to diversify their portfolio. They might have all of their properties here in one part of um, Georgia, and they want to diverse into, uh, diversify into other markets. Some people will diversify by asset class. If you have all of your investment property in, in rentals, um, residential rentals, and you want to uh, delve into commercial, that arena, or even um, you know, industrial, get specific, go from um, you know, industrial to, uh, let's say, um, multifamily, that works. So you can um, diversify within the asset class. Um, we also have people that um, want to consolidate their investments, which is popular um, among some of my older clients that have many properties, and they want to start selling to consolidate their investments. And a very um, a popular replacement property is to go into what's called a Delaware statutory trust. So at the retirement stage of their life, they don't have to manage the property per se. Um, a professional sponsor manages properties all over the U.S., and they receive a nice um, they receive a distribution every month. So um, that could be a great plan for you to employ if you have a, cl a client with many properties, um, and you can get them to sell those properties and consolidate maybe into one. Um, that's a great game plan. Moving markets is popular. Um, during COVID, I saw a lot of people moving from very densely populated states from New York and California, and they were moving to Georgia and the Carolinas. And um, 
that was to a, get away from people and to be safe from COVID, but also um, moving markets. A lot of people uh, move when they retire and certainly um, moving markets, um, you know, that's part of the process. You'll move from one market to another, um, but rather than, you know, managing your assets from 2,500 miles away, I, I came from California and tried to manage um, assets um, from 2,500 miles away. It's, it's really difficult um, unless you have a great property manager. So you can exchange your investment properties from any state to any other state. And then finally, estate planning um, is really the number one of the number one, I should say, of all of these. It's the most popular. People set up themselves um, to retire through exchanges, and they also set up um, their heirs to receive the benefits of their hard work when they pass away. So diversification, you can sell one and buy multiple properties. That's a question I get frequently. Uh, so if you have a commercial property and you want to sell it and buy four residential properties in four different states, that's that works. On the flip side, if you want to consolidate and sell four residential properties and leverage yourself up into a commercial property, you can certainly do that as well. Um, keep in mind when you sell four properties, the time clock starts with the close of the first property. So as a realtor, you really need to price your um, assets um, at, at a market rate that will get those properties to move very quickly. Uh, a few months ago, that wasn't a problem, but now it seems like we're maybe moving we're still in a seller's market, but um, it's starting to slow down. So, and things are staying on, on the market longer. So if you need something to move quickly, you need to price it, you know, aggressively. It's particularly if you're selling four to buy one, you wanna price them so you can sell them so they can all go in one exchange to buy that replacement property. Also, if you're selling four assets for a client, they do need to be all the same taxpayer to go into the same exchange. So if you've had an LLC, um, a husband and a wife, um, an individual and a the wife owned one and the husband owned one, you would, we would have to set up four different exchanges. Uh, they could still buy the same replacement property, but they actually would own that, own that property um, as tenants in common. Um, so those type of transactions are definitely doable. They just require a little more work. And, um, but we do them all the time, so. And by the way, we are a full service intermediary. Um, we provide the full, this is the forward exchange I'm, I'm gonna be discussing soon. But when you move markets, you can move from California to the East Coast, that's not a problem. So as I mentioned uh, earlier, if you're moving from California to retire, on the East Coast, it's very difficult to manage properties from you know, 2,500 miles away. So you might be showing a client around for a primary residence and during a week of touring around um, Georgia, it comes up that the client has investment property. So you know that's a great conversation to delve into. You're not only gonna get the primary residence transaction, but um, it's you know always good to ask if they have other properties. So estate planning. So sometimes we'll have um, clients that, um, you know, the, the patriarch or the or matriarch of the family, and they have one large asset, but they have multiple heirs. And they know when they die, sometimes when death occurs, people um, have fighting over the properties and what to do with them. So we have clients that sometimes will sell the asset before their death and buy three in this instance, um, or in this illustration, the the client will buy um, three replacement properties and in their will, they will have those designated to go to, to certain heirs. And so this is a smart strategy that upon death, if the property came from an exchange, all the deferred taxes from the 1031 do go away upon death and each of the heirs inherits their respective property and the basis gets stepped up and um, they receive the property at fair market value. Now, depending on when they sell from the time of inheritance um, would dictate if they have further taxes. If you hang on to that property for a few years, your basis um, starts with at the time of death, fair market value. And if you sell a couple of years later, then you would have a gain on that new 
stepped up basis to the the sales price um, that you sell for. Now, if that's a gain, you would pay just you know on that gain um, from the time of inheritance. Now, the basic rules for a 1031 exchange are this. For full tax deferral, you want to buy equal or greater than your sales price. And, and that's the easiest way to explain it. Um, some people get mistaken and think it's only their proceeds or their gain. For full tax deferral, I'll repeat it again. If you sell for a million, I like to use a million dollars, um, you need to buy a property for a million dollars. And number two, at closing, um, you would need to reinvest all of the proceeds. So if you own the uh, property free and clear, you need to buy equal or greater basically than your net proceeds. So if you sold for a million and you had closing cost of 8%, then um, you would just need to reimburse the net proceeds. Now, however, a lot of clients do have debt on their properties and that's not a problem. You simply need to buy equal or greater than your sales price, spend all your proceeds and replace the debt and receive nothing but um, real property in the exchange. So what I mean by this is um, if you have a, a client that wants to sell a property that they have, and I'll, and I'll give you an illustration right here that you can see, uh, for a million dollars, they need to buy equal or greater than the million. And if they had a loan of the prop on the property they're selling, 300,000, they need to buy a property equal or greater in debt and they need to spend all of their net proceeds in the new property. So in this example here, we sold for a million and we bought a property for 1.3 million. The debt we had on the old property got retired at closing or paid off and the client went out and got a new loan for 660,000, which is equal or greater than that which they sold. And then the net proceeds, that went to the quali to the qualified intermediary at closing, um, they actually spent all of those. So if you buy equal or greater in sales price, all of the other areas will follow and you'll have full tax deferral. This illustration shows that there's no boot. Boot would be any cash that you receive during the exchange um, or any um, non-like kind property. And non-like kind property would be personal property. So if you receive any personal property in an exchange, it would be taxable. So here's um, an example of sometimes when people wanna buy a lesser valued property, which is perfectly acceptable. So um, if you sell for a million and you only buy an $800,000 property, you um, would have a difference of $200,000. However, you can deduct your closing costs, the cost of sale which would bring your taxable event down to 140,000. So just to show you, um, you can buy a lesser valued property. You'll be taxed on the difference. And when I see something like this happening, I usually call clients and let them know they can buy another property if they choose um, to make up the difference. They could buy a $200,000 property so they won't have any money left over. Or sometimes I get clients that say, well, gosh, I have passive losses to offset that that leftover uh, money on my CPA said I only needed to buy an $800,000 property. So certainly there are lots of um, different scenarios that play into an exchange. And, and we try to kind of flush out the, that, that conversation when we initially, um, or that we try to flush up, you know, the exact scenario that's coming out of the tra transaction. Are they selling one? Are they buying one? Are they selling one and buying a lesser valued property? if they know that. Um, so we try to anticipate um, things that could go wrong in an exchange or things that people don't understand. And a lot of people don't realize you can buy a lesser valued property. So really what's important to note from um, your role as a uh, realtor, and this is very, very important, that you need to have documents in place when you close, when you're selling um, the property. And the most common of all exchanges is the forward delayed exchange. You're going to sell first and buy second. The paperwork called the exchange agreement needs to be in place when you sell the relinquished property. If you don't have, the client doesn't sign it on the date of settlement or before they don't have a valid 1031 exchange. So the date of settlement, if it was October 1st, that would trigger two time clocks. 
and the time clocks in which you have to perform the replacement property purchase is 180 days. And in the first 45 days, you have to identify to the intermediary what you're going to purchase. And we supply the client with an identification form. These are calendar days and they go very, very quickly. So just word of advice, if your 180th day is gonna fall on a weekend or a holiday, you need to go in the business day before or you've blown your exchange if you wait till the Monday after um, the 180th day or the first business day. The 45th day that I identify is a little bit uh, more forgiving in that you can actually uh, identify by sending the form in by email. I get them by fax. I get them by text. Um, but they do need to be to us by the 45th day at midnight. Again, these are calendar days. They go very quickly. Um, this question has come up quite a bit as we're approaching the year. Do you get 180 days if you're approaching the end of the year? And the, the answer to that is yes, you actually get 180 days. If you're going to be filing a tax return and um, you're in the middle of a 1031 exchange, then you simply need an extension on the tax return to provide you the full length of the exchange. So um, that question comes up quite a bit. So you're going to sell first and buy second. Now, again, with the mm -hmm. scenario, when you identify the replacement property within 45 days, how hard and binding is that? In other words, let's say the property you identify in the 45 days falls through for some uh -huh. reason. Has that blown your 1031 exchange or the fact that you identified something and now you have to identify a replacement property? Will that preserve your exchange? Um, so the rules of identification, you must identify by the 45th day. If um, your identified property falls apart within the 45 days, you can revoke your original ID sheet and resubmit a new one. Um, and, and we'll talk about the three rules of identification in a moment, but that's a great question. So if it falls apart, the exchange after the 45th day and you don't have any properties that you have identified, then you you have blown your exchange and the um, taxpayer will pay taxes. Okay. Um, a question that comes up often in this kind of market where it's still a seller's market, a lot of people were having a very difficult time finding replacement property. And they say, well, what if I don't identify any replacement property at all? Well, it, inter it allows the intermediary to um, give back the proceeds to the taxpayer by day 46. If you've ID'd property and you don't purchase any of it, then we have to wait 181 days to return the, the proceeds. And that can make a difference on someone's um, plans going forward. So we're not out to trick you. Um, in fact, we I tell people throughout the process, don't identify a bad property. Um, that doesn't make sense. It's better probably not to identify anything at all. Um, and just you know pay the taxes. But there are three rules of identification and you're only in one rule at a time. And the rules say that in the first, um, we call it the first rule or the three property rule, you can ID up to any three properties of any value. This is about where 99% of our clients fall into that first rule. And some um, folks wanna ID more than that, which is fine. However, there's a cap to, to the 200% rule or the second rule. It says you can ID any number over three as long as the sum of those properties don't exceed 200% of the sale price of the property you sold. That rule only kicks in when you physically put more than um, three properties on your identification form. And to identify, you're going to put the property address, the city, state, and zip and the sales price, you're gonna sign it and date it and send it back to the qualified intermediary. So the 200% rule is great, is a great rule for higher valued properties. So for example, if you sold a property for 200,000 and you wanted to ID four properties, you could put down four properties at $100,000 each because two times 200,000 is 200%. That would be your cap. $400,000 worth of property. So if you ID'd four properties, a hundred thousand, you're within the um, guidelines of that second rule. 
And if you sold for 200,000, you might just buy two of those properties. You could buy all four if you wanted, but for full tax deferral, you would need to buy at least two of them. Now, sometimes we'll get ID sheets and somebody will send us 30 properties on their ID sheet and it exceeds the 200% rule. And what happens is you push yourself into the 95% rule. And that says you actually have to purchase 95% of what you've identified. And so when I call somebody up and say, well, gee, you sold here for you know a million dollars and you ID 20 properties and a million dollars, you have to buy you know 95% of 20 million and their jaws drop because they're like, I can't afford that. So we keep people on track. We scrutinize every intake form or identification form that is sent to us. And we go over them um, with the client to make sure they're buying what they intended to buy. Now, a lot of people that do exchanges want to know, you know, it's investment property for investment property. Can I buy a primary residence? Now, the answer is no. Um, you need to buy an investment property, but after two years, you can convert the investment property to a either primary residence or personal use property. So you need to follow a, a revenue procedure called 2008-16, which outlines a, a couple of things. It outlines how much the taxpayer, um, well, how, how long they need to own the property before they convert it, which is two full years. Now, if that property happens to be at a location like the beach or the mountains, some taxpayers are going to rent it, but they also are interested in personal use. So if you have a property that you own at the beach and you intend to retire there, you need to rent it for two years. You can personally use it each of those two years for 14 calendar days or 10% of the total time you rent it. And at a minimum, you need to rent it for two weeks. So taxpayer can use it two weeks each year and they must rent the property for two weeks out of the year. However, the other 48 weeks that are left over doesn't give the taxpayer liberty to go use the investment property. So it would behoove that taxpayer to, to get it rented because that's the purpose of an investment property is to buy a property that's a good investment that's yielded a good return on investment. Um, and so then once you've met those two years and you've stayed within those um, requirements, then you can uh, convert the property to either a primary residence or a second home that you use as much as you want. So here it is, you can sell your rental property and use it to buy a dream home, but you do have to rent it out a couple of years before you move in. Um, and you should always consult with the tax advisor before you do that. Now, um, this comes up quite a bit. People want to know, well, gosh, if I sell this property that I've lived in as my primary, um, do I get my primary residence exclusion? And first of all, if you sell a property that you've lived in as a um, that came from a 1031, in order to sell it as a primary residence, you have to be on title for five years. So again, that's if it came from a 1031 exchange, in order to sell it as a primary, you have to be on title five years and um, live there too. Now, up until 2008, this was pretty slick. If you met those objectives, you could um, sell the property and get rid of all your taxes from all your exchanges. However, the IRS realized they were giving away, I, I say the candy store, they were giving away a lot of taxes. So what happened was in, um, I should say, let me go back to this slide. In 2020, um, uh, eight, you could no longer um, sell a property that came from a 1031 exchange without paying a proration on your primary residence exclusion. So no longer can you rid yourself of all your tax obligations by um, simply moving into an investment property that came from a 1031. You have to, first of all, own it for five years. You have to have lived there at least two but at that point, you get a proration. It does not rid you of all your tax obligations. That, that law changed a while ago. So, um, you know, depending on what your objective is, some people um, will move out of that property when they near retirement and rent it again and bring it back into um, a 1031 investment property. 
However, if they sell that property before their primary residence sunsets, they can actually double dip into two tax codes. So that's a very popular tax strategy. So you can put some money in your pocket from the exclusion, but also exchange a portion of it as investment. Okay, so I, I might have gone over your head with that one, but um, just if you are you have a client that's currently living in a property that came from a 1031 um, and they're going to sell it, make sure you seek out advice of a qualified intermediary that understands the tax code and blending a couple of tax codes to provide, provide the ultimate tax benefit. Now, a qualified intermediary must be present during the 1031 exchange or um, they typically act as the principal. They're guiding the transaction to prepare the exchange agreement and um, they hold the exchange proceeds after the um, transaction has closed. So the closing attorney would wire us the, the proceeds. And um, we also prepare the documentation that make it a 1031. It's called the exchange agreement. And that basically um, has an assignment of the contract in that agreement. So if you're, and this is a question that comes up with real estate brokers, they want to know, do I physically have to write in the intermediary's name to the contract? The answer is no. Your seller is Doug Dean. He's going to sell. And if he's doing a 1031 exchange, our documents will make that assignment of the contract within our documentation. And so um, Doug Dean is going to sell and he's going to buy the replacement property the same way in which he's vested as an individual on the replacement property. So the taxpayer that sells will be the same exact taxpayer that takes title to the replacement property. They will sign that exchange agreement. The funds come to us and we put those funds into segregated deposit accounts of very large banks that um, have been vetted um, very well by a parent company, but they also have what's called a high IDC rating, which is a rating that Fannie and Freddie give banks um, to um, rate the security of their um, deposit accounts. The higher the number, the safer the bank. And we only um, bank with a very um, at large banks and those that have high IDC ratings. The perfect score is 300. And we try to pick banks that have um, those ratings right around um, 270 and above. So um, while the funds are with us, they are accruing interest. And that is the taxpayer receives that after the 1031 exchange. Of course, that's taxable, but they do receive the interest from the minute their proceeds hit that account. Now, when the, the funds are sitting in the account, anytime there's any money movement, the exchanger, the taxpayer is required to, to sign for an authorization to disperse funds, as well as our exchange coordinator. So it always takes two dual signatures to release funds. And we always um, check wire instructions verbally. Um, and we take every, every precaution we can to um, combat all the fraudsters that are out there these days trying to prey upon um, you know, wire transfers and whatnot. So this brings up the subject when you um, choose an intermediary, they're not all the same. Make sure that your client has used the intermediary before or they come recommended from somebody that's used that intermediary. Um, you, you know, some people say, oh, well, the dollar, the, the fee structure is a little bit higher. Well, you get what you pay for um, sometimes. Our, our fee is $1,500 and it covers a sale and a, a replacement property. If you're getting a fee around $500, you have to question, A, how much the intermediary knows, um, what kind of bonding do they have? Um, the less expensive, um, when you have those very inexpensive fees, it makes me think that, um, that they're, First of all, they don't know the marketplace on the, the fee of exchanges these days, but if you're getting one for really inexpensive, be very careful of that intermediary. You also want an intermediary that is um, not a sole practitioner. Um, a lot of money has been stolen over the years but where people have just taken off with their exchange um, proceeds. So you always want an organization that has a check and balance of, of those funds. You don't want one person um, in charge of being able to just wire the funds away. So um, find out how the funds are um, you know, uh, handled once they come into the intermediary. Um, are they put into one account 
or an independent segregated account. You never want to commingle monies um, when you're doing a 1031 exchange. So that's a good question to ask right off the bat. So our performance guarantee is $50 million. So we carry a lot of insurance. Our fidelity bond is 100 million and our e &O insurance is 30 million so that if we were to do something egregious, your, your client is covered. It, it's, we're a very transparent organization. We have our um, uh, financials on our website. We have our fidelity bonds and our e &O insurance bonds on the website. We um, we keep um, the only thing that we don't do in a transaction is when the proceeds go into an independent deposit account for the client. We don't give them the account number for those proceeds. Um, we did have a couple of exchangers in the past go to the bank and withdraw their money from the bank, which right there ended the the ten thirty one exchange. So. Um, that's basically kind of it in a nutshell on that, on the um, security questions you need to ask of the, the, the qualified intermediary. And I know we're coming up right um, towards the end of the hour, but this is just a quick overview on the basics of a forward exchange where you're going to sell first and buy second. You're going to approach the intermediary um, before you close um, on your transaction and Again, it can be any type of investment property anywhere in the U.S. Be mindful that you want to um, make sure your client has held the property for productive use. Those were the things we talked about. Um, you want to stay away from flipping properties because let me just tell you, at the end of your exchange, you do have to fill out at tax time what's called an 8824. And it says the client acquired the property on this date, dispersed of it on another date and what were they doing with the, um, the property when they owned it. So um, if they get audited, that form has a, paints a very clear picture of what you're doing with the property. So you, I always tell people, go ahead and do a 1031 exchange if you have a defensible argument or you feel like you can defend the nature of what, of what the um, investment property was when you had it. Um, we didn't get into uh, things like of who you can buy from in a 1031 exchange, but real quick, when you do a 1031 exchange, generally you buy from a third party that you uh, are not related to. You do not want to be buying from related parties and transactions. So um, you can sell to a related party, but you can't buy from one unless the related parties also doing a 1031 exchange. So I um, just wanna point out those kind of things that come up very frequently. Um, and then you see if anybody in the, um, in the presentation here in the Zoom room wants to ask any questions, we can open it up. I'm happy to do that. Brittany, we did have a question about fees, uh, typical fees for a 1031 exchange. And I believe uh -huh. I heard you uh, mention about a $1,500 fee being typical for your services for uh -huh. what I call a traditional or forward 1031 exchange where you sell first and buy second. Did I quote that accurately or hear that accurately? That's accurate. And that's um, our competitors charge about the same. So we're, we're all about um, the same. On the high end, you can see fees as much as $5,000. Um, those typically um, come from uh, the banks that are higher. But um, yeah, the normal transaction is about $1,500 when you sell first and buy second. And um, like I said, 99% of our customers will structure the transaction that way. There are exchanges where you, if you need to buy first and sell second called a reverse exchange, those start at about 6,500. And the reason being is the intermediary actually takes title to the property. You will lend us the money, you meaning the taxpayer, the exchanger, to buy that replacement property before they've sold the relinquished property. And then um, the seller's market, we saw a lot of people we're still doing that because it's a way to secure that replacement property first. And often they're forced into closing on that property before they've sold. So we do reverse, reverse exchanges and those start quite a bit higher because we take title to the property. But just for a basic forward exchange where we don't take title, the deeding goes directly from the seller to the buyer. 
it's $1,500. And then that covers one sale, one purchase, and each additional property is $200. Wait a minute, there was also a question is, can you uh, use uh, international property or does all the property for 1031 exchange have to be U.S. domestic property? Right. Um, so it is U.S. for U.S. Um, properties. Uh, before 1987, you could exchange outside the United States, but it got too hard to track. Our company does not do foreign exchanges. Um, where you can do foreign for foreign properties. Um, there are intermediaries out there that do that. We, we do not delve into that, um, that business. We're strictly involved in the United States transactions um, that occur on U.S. soil or the U.S. Virgin Islands. And so, yes, that is a, a place where you can exchange is the U.S. Virgin Islands. And we, we see quite a bit of activity there. Um, and uh, yeah, I would say I probably get two or three every month that, that buy in the Virgin Islands. So um, don't discount that as um, you know, place to buy great replacement property. And again, as long as you're exchanging over and over and over, you'll keep deferring those taxes until you die. And again, those taxes, when you die, all the obligation to pay back the deferred taxes do go away upon death. So your heirs who inherit the property do not have to pay that back. There's no obligation. The obligation to pay taxes on those properties from the 1031 go to the grave. And then the, the basis gets stepped up. And that's really um, a, a nice way to, um, to do estate planning for the benefit of your next generation. But the, the benefit to you while you're living, you, the, the exchanger or your clients, um, is when you have investment property, you want to be taking depreciation if it's allowed or allowable coupled with that appreciation is where you create a lot of wealth over the years. And just so everyone is familiar with it, uh, I want to touch on the concept of stepped up basis. Stepped up basis, uh, and you, Whitney, feel free to jump in and correct me if I stated incorrectly. Yes. When property passes from a deceased person to an heir, their what we call basis in the property, their value in the property is the value in the property at the time the deceased person died. Now, the deceased person may have a much lower basis. They may have bought it many years ago for a lower value, but the heirs take it at the value at time of death so that when they subsequently sell it, their gain is the difference between the subsequent sale and the value when they acquired it at time of death. So it's a way to uh, have step up in basis by taking the value of the property when the deceased died. Correct. And um, just to kind of on a similar note, a lot uh, there, I get this question, should I gift a property while I'm living to one of my heirs? Um, on the term, you know, along the lines of basis, you, that basis gets um, passed along to whomever you gift the property to. So it might not be the smartest strategy when you're thinking of um, providing something of real value to your heir at death. Um, all the intentions are good. People want to put their kids on title to establish credit and whatnot. Um, you know, maybe if you do 1%, um, some people think that's a good way to go about it. But if you gift that property, a hundred percent to your to your heir, then your basis gets forwarded. So that low basis would continue onward with um, the heir or the the person to whom you gifted the property while you were living. So wow. I was just going to say we have a lot of these subjects that I covered um, on our um, website, and I'll I'll just say, tell you this: if you um, email me, you can sign up for a newsletter, and it's great information to share with people that are thinking of becoming investors. Because once you get an investor client that's doing 1031 exchanges, then they really do have to keep exchanging, exchanging, or the tax hits can be very substantial if you came from a whole host of um, 1031s prior. So we provide a, um, a monthly newsletter, which I you're welcome to share with your clients or incorporate into your own um, newsletter. Um, and I would say you can borrow any concept or idea. The plagiarism is not an issue with us. You could borrow it right out of our and the context of our website. Well, thank you, Whitney. Uh, a couple of nice comments in the uh, chat box. Great info, thank you. Thank you, great info, great presentation. 
Whitney, we appreciate you being our guest today on the uh, Business Builder Speaker Series. Uh, I know we had a lot of interest. A lot of agents had said this is an area that they need, did need to learn more about. Mm -hmm. For everyone on the call, we do record these Business Builder Speaker Series, and we will post it on our YouTube site. You'll receive a follow-up email uh, letting you know when the, uh, the videos are posted so that you can go back and review it or share the video with somebody who didn't get to see it but wants to learn some more about 1031 exchanges. So you'll get a, a link to the, uh, the YouTube site and you can watch the replay of our class today. Uh, I'll say again, a special thanks to you, Whitney, for being our guest today. And to each of you, thank you for taking your time to uh, spend it with us and learn about 1031 exchanges. We appreciate you being with us today. We'll share the link for the um, uh, video when it's available on the YouTube channel. And as always, go out and make today a great day. And thanks for your hard work helping everybody with their real estate needs. We look forward to seeing you at the real estate closing table soon. Mm -hmm.